Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is Brian Finney, author of the new novel, Dangerous Conjectures. Brian, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much, Jeff. Nice to be well, with if, you. Great. Well, if someone hasn't yet heard about your new novel, Dangerous Conjectures, how would you describe the novel? Well, it's a novel that's set in the first three months of 2020, when, if you remember, the uh, virus was spreading, and uh, by the t- time you reach the end of the novel, all the schools and offices have closed down that day. Uh, it's also located in the Bay Area, in uh, Oakland, to be specific. It focuses on uh, a couple uh, in their 40s, um, Adam, who is a professor of computer science at UC Berkeley, and Julia, who, his wife, uh, who is a research assistant um, at the ACLU branch in San Francisco. And they have a 12-year-old daughter. Basically speaking, um, Adam's graduate class is asked by the Secret Service to investigate uh, a, a leak uh, that embarrassed the government. And when they go into it uh, and uh, get very close to discovering who it was who actually was responsible for it, uh, the, the government agents return and say, drop it, drop it. And that arouses his suspicion. And he starts investigating a new conspiracy theory, uh, QAnon, and discovers that it has a local branch in the area, which, of course, QAnon does. QAnon isn't entirely, you know, it, um, internet phenomenon. Um, and uh, being, a, being a computer scientist, he cannot understand how so many Americans uh, as well as other people world, world, worldwide, uh, can subscribe to such an absurd theory. Because, as you know, at, at that time, QAnon wasn't known, even to, among my friends. Um, but now everybody knows about QAnon, uh, which subscribes to the idea that there is a sort of cabal, a demonic cabal of pedophiles, mainly Democrats, <laughs> who, who are intent upon them. Um, undermining uh, the government in power through what's called the secret state, which is, so to speak, powerful officials within the government who operate independently of it. Um, at any rate, while he's doing this, his wife, uh, Julia, is uh, becoming increasingly frightened by the spread of the virus, which she takes more seriously than he does, even though he's the scientist. Um, and which causes her to make uh, some very, uh, what should I say, um, questionable decisions, um, the, the least of which is simply subscribing to some of the current uh, conspiracy theories and uh, not QAnon that were spreading at the time about the virus. Uh, but more, uh, more dangerously, she tries to um, get rid of an ex who suddenly uh, reappears in her life by sleeping with him once. Um, and instead of doing that, of course, it has a very reverse, and he becomes obsessed with her and stalks her, stalks the family. Uh, and the the violence that he represents uh, to this couple and to their daughter um, is, uh, if you like, a, a miniature reflection of what is happening uh, nationwide in the primaries, where the White House and QAnon are, between them, stirring up violent confrontations outside the polling booths uh, in an effort to undermine the elections and to uh, ensure the continuity of the existing presidency. So that, roughly speaking, is the scenario. <laughs> sure. And I'm curious, do you remember the original idea or impetus that led you to writing Dangerous Conjectures? Uh, this wasn't the only idea, but what, one of the ideas that impelled me into it was that I, too, as you know, uh, am a professor emeritus, although in literature and not in computer science. Uh, but I, too, like most professors, believe in um, superiority of um, reasoning and fact-finding 
to conspiracy theories. And I too, like Adam, couldn't understand why this ridiculous, absurd conspiracy theory was catching on like wildfire. And one of the things that Adam has to learn in the course of the book is that um, reason will always take second place to emotion if the two come into conflict with one another. And that there were so many Americans whose lives were such a disaster, who were on the point of you know, running out of money and running out of food, being declared homeless. Uh, and here was this theory that invited them to join the winning side uh, and that, you know, just round the corner was waiting, you know, the Elysium that they all uh, desired, uh, but were not experiencing in their lives. Interesting. And I'm curious, <clears throat> hang on just one second, I, I'm having a computer issue. I can edit it out. Sorry about that. Uh, well, I know that you write about conspiracy theories in the novel, Dangerous Conjectures. And I'm sure that you've thought about this uh, during the writing of the novel and the thinking about the novel. What What is the appeal of conspiracy theories to so many Americans? Well, um, you know, this this is what, what I'm saying is that so many Americans, you know, their, their lives have deteriorated. And, that you know, instead of seeing their children as, you know, being offered an even better standard of living than themselves, they see the thing going in the reverse direction. They also, many of them, experience um, extreme, or shall I say, monetary concerns. They, you know, they, they live from paycheck to paycheck. Um, they have difficulty putting food on the table. They're threatened with being kicked out of their, their rental. Um, and, you know, their lives are so, so uh, unsatisfactory that here is this um, alternative world, if you like, that is offered to them, yeah, where, where everything is black and white, and where, where they are invited to join the white and to become intricately in, involved in it because they're invited to research each of the conspiracy theory uh, untruths. Um, and uh, what it does is to make them feel as if you know they're part of an army that is advancing towards an eventual triumph whereas their lives are going in the opposite direction for that. So, of course, it's, um, you know, uh, who, who wouldn't prefer that fantasy to the, you know, very uh, depressing reality? Sure, sure. I'm curious, what was your initial writing journey that led you to writing and getting your first novel published? <laughs> um, well, my, my writing goes well, my my. I've only written two novels, and those have both been in the last uh, four years. Um, before that, I wrote like seven nonfiction books. So do are you asking me about the beginning of my writing uh, books generally or of novels? Uh, well, I guess your novels. Um, okay. You know, you've had this um, uh, nonfiction career with seven nonfiction books, and I know that you have taught English. What led you to writing your, your two novels? Uh, I stopped teaching full time. I'd been, uh, I'd spent a lot of my life uh, trying to help students understand the nature of narrative, how novels are constructed, um, what makes, you know, what works and what doesn't. Um, and finally, you know, here I was free, uh, you know, I could do whatever I wanted. I, there was no more pressure to publish or perish. Um, and, uh, I, I, to, to tell you the truth, I just found myself starting to write that first novel, Money Matters. Um, and in order to do that, I came up with a character who was uh, as unlike me as she, as she, she possibly could be. I mean, you know, <laughs> I'm a man, she's a woman, I'm old, she's young. Uh, I still have English expressions and speak with an English accent, and she's whole, whole, wholly American. Um, my life uh, has been relatively stable. She is surviving on part-time jobs and living in her sister's apartment and generally hasn't got her life fully together. You should be saving for the future, but savings accounts suck, and investing can be scary. We combine the ease of savings with the real returns of investing. 
We call it Save Vesting, and it's only available in our new app, Stairs. Stairs offers 4 to 6% returns, no fees, and you can withdraw anytime. Do your future a favor. Visit stairsapp.com today. But what I found was that um, I, 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 I was able to discover her voice, if you like, to put it as simply as that. So that once I'd done that, whatever situation I put her in, I, I sort of instinctually was able to write out her dialogue, write out her actions. And the book wrote itself very readily. I mean, I thoroughly enjoyed writing the book because, it, you know, it sort of flowed out. I'm curious, are you working on a third novel now? <laughs> you, you're touching on a sole point. I, I, was, I was working on the idea of a third novel, and the idea was based on the fact that maybe the biggest issue facing, you know, civilization today is the growing inequality between the rich and the poor, uh, which could well, you know, create the breakdown of civilization as we know it, if it goes off this rate. And, um, so I, I came up with the scenario of a, a hedge fund manager whose life is invaded by a homeless woman. And I was going to, you know, bring the two totally different um, understandings of life into conflict and eventually into some kind of rapprochement, maybe into a romantic, you know, conclusion. Um, but the idea was, uh, proved more interesting than the actual um, <laughs> realization. The characters wouldn't come to life. They remained examples of, you know, a theory rather than individuals. So just recently, about a week ago, or yes, I gave that up and I'm waiting. I'm, you know, because I'm, I'm not in a hurry. I'm not dependent upon, <laughs> God forbid, um, you know, royalties for uh, my survival. Uh, so I can afford to give it time and wait until the appropriate idea bubbles up and then I will be writing the third novel. That's great. Well, I know that you've taught English for many years at the college level. Have you also taught creative writing? Uh, I know I've never, I've never taught creative writing. Interestingly, no. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. What, what were what were some of what were some of the courses that you that you usually taught? Um, I mean my 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 if you like my speciality area is right. 20, 20th, 21st century fiction, and in particular English fiction. I'm one well, of the most recent book, books I wrote. Well, the two most recent books I wrote were one was called English Fiction since 1984. And the other was a, a full-length study of Martin Amis, who was one of the most innovative English novelists of the, the 90s and influenced a lot of people around him. Um, but I, you know, I, for a long time, I was freelancing. And so I would have to take what I could get. And so I found myself teaching anything from Chaucer and Shakespeare to, um, what should I say, world, li world literature <laughs> or, or the arts. I had, I had one horrific course where I had to teach all the arts, including, you know, jazz and film uh, from the <laughs> Renaissance, the present day in 15 weeks. And wow. I think I can go into a lot more than my students. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm curious, uh, you mentioned Martin Amos. Uh, what have you been reading lately in the last year or two that you really enjoyed that you would mention novels? Uh, the, the, the novel I most enjoy is Where the Crawdads Sing. Do you, have you come across it at all? Yes, yes, I'm familiar with it. I, it's, um, I, I mean, it rightly stayed on the New York Times bestseller list for, for weeks and weeks and weeks. Uh, it has, yeah, it's set in the marsh area of North Carolina off the coast there, and it evokes the landscape so vividly that the landscape becomes a major character, really, in the novel because the the young uh, major character is actually uh, left to her own devices to grow up in that landscape without any parents. Um, and so, you know, she learns from, you know, from the, na na the natural life around her. Wonderfully, wonderfully described in the vote. Great, great novel. That's and it's great. That's one. She's a, I, I forget, she's some kind of um, scientist who's written, you know, 
novels within a discipline. I'm not novels, books within a discipline, but never right. fiction until this. So I'm curious, what was your writing process for uh, your two novels? Did you do any outline or plotting, or did you just dive into the narrative? Um, it, it was a mixture. I mean, I think with the first one, I did start off diving straight in, and then I realized that I needed to have some kind of structure. And so I did a very rough structure for it, particularly as it's just like an amateur detective novel. Um, and then I, I felt absolutely free to depart from that structure whenever, you know, a character's needs said, no, they can't do that. It wouldn't, you know, it's not, it's not probable. And I would then rewrite the rest of the outline. Uh, so it went, you know, it, it alternated between the two. Sure. Uh, but I mean, obviously the, the, the actual fictional world and its demands uh, overrode any, any considerations that I might have pre-planned in the outline. So the outline was constantly under reviewing. In the That's second great. novel, Dangerous Conjectures, um, I, did, I did do more of an outline because I structured it daily from about the middle of January until the middle of March of 2020. And each day... I alternated between the first person voice of um, Julian, the first person voice of Adam. And when I sent, sent the draft off to a professional ed my professional editor, she said, it reads like a diary. And so I then completely reset, and it was in the present tense as well. So I then completely reset it without doing a lot of rewriting, but a lot of grammatical change. Um, by sure. putting all the, all the verbs into the past tense and <laughs> putting the eyes into he and she, <laughs> and that that interestingly still meant that the focalization, you know, the, the the point of view alternated between the two of them, but but nevertheless it came through the impersonal narrator's voice. Interesting. Well, yeah. Well, given your experience with your with writing your two novels, what writing advice would you offer for those who are working on their own stories and novels? Um, well, first of all, uh, or when whenever there is any kind of conflict between your your own um, convictions, your own ideas, your own responses to life, and those of the characters in your fictional world, forget yours <laughs> because otherwise it won't ring true the whole thing will you know sound more like a sermon or a lecture or something <laughs> S secondly um always ne if in doubt uh, always erase uh, never be afraid to rewrite because very often that's the solution to any kind of impasse you find yourself in um it, you really, sometimes you've only got to eliminate, you know, a, a paragraph or something and, and the whole thing is open again for you. So don't be afraid to make changes and also listen, uh, after you've done your first draft, listen to everybody. Uh, don't necessarily, you know, uh, assume that they're right, but listen to them and don't, and be prepared to rewrite extensively. Um, the first draft is never the same as the, the final version of the book um and then finally if you're self-publishing um get yourself some kind of uh, assistance just as you did with the editing get yourself some kind of professional assistance with publicizing it or the book will disappear into a morass of other books on amazon <laughs> within the day <laughs> that's true well, where can people find you online if they'd like to learn more about you and your two novels? Well, the two novels are both available on Amazon, uh, in uh, both as an audiobook, as an ebook, and as a paperback. Um, and I also, ha they will become available also on other, other um, you know, mm -hmm. outlets. And I also have a very extensive website with links to, you know, describing the books and with links to where they can be bought um, on bhfinney, F-I-N-N-E-Y, at bhfinney.com. Great. Well, again, we've been speaking with Brian Finney, author of the new novel, Dangerous Conjectures. The book is on sale now, so go buy a copy. And Brian, thanks for doing this interview. No, thank you for having me.
Great. You should be saving for the future, but savings accounts suck, and investing can be scary. We combine the ease of savings with the real returns of investing. We call it Save Vesting, and it's only available in our new app, Stairs. Stairs offers 4% to 6% returns, no fees, and you can withdraw anytime. Do your future a favor. Visit StairsApp.com today.